Welcome back into the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein, along with my co-host, my partner in crime, the Dr. Jimmy Bucciolato. Hi, everyone. Hey, now. And behind the glass is our producer, Ben. Uh, the superstar, the MVP of 2022, Benny Agusta. Too nice. Too nice, Scott. <laughs> so uh, I'm really, really, really jacked about this episode. I've been uh, hunting down our guests over uh, the last month and finally was able to, uh, it's like when you go out fishing and, and you, you bag that big that big trophy fish. And uh, I'm so excited to, to bring on a, uh, a Hall of Famer. A uh, an icon in law enforcement in the, in the state of Oklahoma, and one of the more uh, decorated detectives in in the history of the Tulsa uh, Police Department, Mike Huff. Thank you for joining us. You are uh, your reputation precedes you. Well, thank you for the nice words. <laughs> I'm I'm just uh, made it to the finish line, so that's all I wanted to do. It took me uh, about 37 years to get there, but I got there. Well, we're going to talk about one of the uh, highlights of your career and just I'm going to give everyone a, a quick, you know, minute to two minute primer, which with me maybe means four or five minutes, but I'll try to be quick and then we're going to throw it to, to uh, Mike and we're going to just deep dive this thing. So we're going to talk about the night the, the, the 1981 gangland slain of Roger Wheeler, uh, you know, dare I say the most infamous murder in Oklahoma history. Uh, there haven't, I'm guessing had never been before or since a uh, organized crime related uh, mob hit that went down in Oklahoma. Roger Wheeler was one of the most prominent businessmen in Tulsa, a multimillionaire, uh, an owner of a professional sports league. Uh, it was called World High Lie. And for people that uh, you know, probably in their 40s or uh, older might remember in the 1980s, early 90s on ESPN, uh, World High Lie had a television deal and there was a lot of High Lie uh, being um, uh, produced and shown on, on television. And then there was the opening of Miami Vice, the, the iconic uh, cop TV show on NBC would, would have High Lie uh, in their opening credits. And uh, we can talk about what that game is in a second. But uh, Roger Wheeler was the owner of World High Lie. He traced his roots back to South Boston. And uh, when he purchased World High Lie in, I believe, 1978, uh, he was unaware that the Irish mafia, the Irish mob, the Winter Hill gang from Boston, Whitey Bulger's group had infiltrated, had already infiltrated uh, the uh, administration and uh, the, the security force and the uh, <laughs> accounting department at uh, uh, at World High Lie. And they were stealing from. Of vending and par parking contracts that World Highlight had uh, in Connecticut, it was a a big sport when it was when it was in its heyday. Uh, it was a really big sport in New England and in Florida, were the really the, the, the two hot spots. And uh, Roger Wheeler discovered that he was being fleeced by these South Boston mob guys that he had uh, not let in the front door. Uh, the it, they had been let in the front door before he'd even. Uh, owned the company, but when he made it known that he was going to clean house, uh, the South Boston Winter Hill gang got nervous because they, they saw a, a big stream of, of illegal income um, coming to a conclusion. They put out a hit on Wheeler. They gave the hit to a, a prolific South Boston hitman named Johnny Martirano. And Johnny Martirano in May of 1981 traveled to Tulsa uh, did a couple days of uh, recon and then went to Southern Hills Country Club, one of the most historic, uh, famous golf clubs, country clubs in the United States. Just had, I believe, just had the U.S. Open recently um, or one of the majors was there recently. And uh, Roger Wheeler was a member of Southern Hills and had just finished his uh, weekly f foursome. Uh, I believe it was a Wednesday. And when he came into the parking lot to go home, uh, he was murdered by uh, Johnny Martirano. And because of the corruption in the Boston FBI that we learned about years later with Whitey Bulger being this ruthless 
organized crime lord that was also a, a, a co- confidential informant for the FBI. What we're going to hear about from Mike is this very heroic tale of trying to solve a epic murder case while being undermined by forces in law enforcement. When you when you're running a local investigation in Oklahoma and you need to get help from the federal authorities in Massachusetts and you're being told you're crazy and to to look look in the other direction, you don't know what you're talking about. And Mike Huff saw this thing to the end from day one. He was the first detective on the scene when this happened on May 27, 1981. And then he eventually closed down this case in the early 2000s after Johnny Martirano uh, flipped. And we were able to finally uh, put to bed uh, this 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 great unsolved mystery or this former unsolved mystery that just transfixed so many people for 30 years. Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Yes, sir. So, Mike, let's take let's just uh, take you back to that day. Uh, I'm sure you weren't. Uh, <laughs> this probably wasn't a a normal occurrence. Getting called to a place like Southern Hills uh, to learn that there had been a gangland homicide. Oh no, this was uh, something that was uh, really unique. I mean, we'd never been there. Uh, it's a beautiful place, but guys like me. Uh, don't play golf at places like Southern Hills. You know, maybe Tiger Woods or Jack Nicholas is out there playing, but not me. So to talk about when the call came in. You're just on your desk. You're a young detective. You'd been a detective at that point for a year. Um, it's about, what, four, five o'clock, and you, you get a yeah, phone call. Yeah, it was call. a little after four. I was uh, actually sitting there waiting for a phone call uh, from the hospital. I had shot a guy a couple of weeks before a, a murder suspect, and uh, he was in ICU. And I started off each uh, shift uh, calling the hospital um, and seeing if he's still alive. Uh, so we did that, and then we decided that uh, we need to uh, do the most important thing in the shift, and that was make it out for dinner. So uh, that phone call from Southern Hills interrupted our dinner plans and uh we made our way out there uh having no idea you know what had happened we thought maybe it was a a kitchen help or a groundskeeper uh dispute or something and so as we got there it was uh, uh put to us that mr wheeler walked out to his car from the clubhouse uh, a guy walked up, opened his door, shot him between the eyes, and uh, uh, that guy and a uh, driver uh, drove out of the uh, parking lot. So that was the start of our day. So there and were eyewitnesses? Day, to- there, were, there were several eyewitnesses, right? There were uh, 13 eyewitnesses. Uh, most of them were up in an area. Uh, where the swimming swimming pool was. So they weren't really focused uh, on that area of the parking lot, but uh, we did have some witnesses. Uh, A couple of them got uh, partial tag numbers uh, of uh, the getaway car. And uh, so we had something to work with at that time. At, at what point did you realize this was a professional hit and this wasn't just, you know, a, a domestic dispute or an argument between employees like that? This was a contract hit. Well, you know, a hit has a lot of things. It could be a hit with, uh, say, a, a personal dispute. Mr. Wheeler had a lot of uh, business dealings. Uh, he wasn't necessarily. uh uh, you know, uh, a, a great uh, leader in the business world. I mean, he always was looking for a better deal. And so we thought maybe that could be a business dispute. Maybe it had some personal uh, aspect to it. So uh, we thought he was targeted for the murder, but we had no idea that uh, the mob would be behind this. That took a while to get there. Talk a little bit about Roger Wheeler, the man. Uh, he made his fortune. 
he came from uh, Boston to Oklahoma, I believe, in the 40s and made his fortune in uh, oil and then eventually uh, uh, elect, uh, audio electronics. Yes, he uh, he grew up, uh, you know, <coughs> pardon me, he grew up in uh, Boston from, uh, you know, not a wealthy family. I think his father was a, a printer at the Christian Science Monitor, uh, which is located in Boston. And uh, so he went to the Navy uh, in uh, World War II came back. Uh, I don't know where he went to college off the, offhand right now, but uh, uh, he met his wife who was from Kansas. And so they got married. They wound up moving to Tulsa. Uh, and, uh, you know, he became a wheel in, in Tulsa. I mean, he, he really was uh, turning over deals right and left. Uh, Telex Corporation which uh, was uh, an employer of about 5,000 people. Mr. Wheeler was a, a CEO, chairman of the board. Um, he also had side uh, investments with uh, oil and gas. Um, he owned a beautiful ranch south of Tulsa. Um, you know, he, had, uh, he had made about $50 million turning over an investment uh, that was uh, uh, a pipe uh, uh, company. And uh, at that time, uh, oil was uh, kind of upswing in Oklahoma. And so that uh, investment with the uh, pipe uh, created a $50 million profit. And so with that $50 million, he uh, started reaching out, looking for investments, and he was led to this investment uh, by the First Bank of Boston. Um, and uh, so he, uh, it was like a, it was like a business associate of his, or someone that he knew. I don't know if it was from childhood or not. That was a big shot at the First Bank of Boston, and unbeknownst to Wheeler. The, hadn't this guy kind of uh, let some of the roosters into the hen house? Yes, such a great word. For the, <laughs> uh, uh, so Mr. Wheeler was kind of a patsy in this deal. He was led toward this investment. Um, organized crime had its hooks in it. Uh, before Mr. Wheeler got there, uh, the First Bank of Boston was... Uh, you know, involving themselves in it. I mean, you couldn't figure out who's who, and you really needed a program to figure out who the players were. So the banker was compromised the banker was, from the beginning. He was a the dirty. banker had some ties in into Southie and in Winter Hill, I believe. So he knew that 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 highlight was a compromise. Was a yeah. And so let's also let people know what exactly highlight is. So again, well, I, if you're if you're old, if you're a little bit older. You probably have some memories of it. If you're under 40 right now, you probably have no idea what high lie is. So maybe explain what that is, Mike. High lie is this very fast moving game. Um, and there's at least two people playing on a high lie port. And uh, uh, they're, they have these uh, baskets uh, on their arm. They're called, uh, I believe, cestus. And uh, they sling this very hard ball uh, with those cestas. It gets going well over 100 miles an hour. And the ball, at Palata, uh, hits a granite wall. Uh, it's like playing hand, handball or racquetball. And uh, that granite wall will propel the ball back. And the other guy... Uh, gets the uh, ball and throws it, and they play till uh, one or the other uh, doesn't make that return throw. And so kind that's like a cro- what bet on. It's kind of like a cross between high-speed handball and racquetball. Uh, it was um, 
from from my research, it was uh, invented in an area in Europe between Spain and France. And uh, how does it end up in Miami? As it, 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 it started in New England. Or, okay. The, these, these um, I'm not sure what the region is called, but people from that region they ended up coming to New England and to Hartford, Connecticut, and Boston, okay. and I think in the 20s or 30s. And yes. eventually it it's expands to, to Miami and, and parts of all, really all up and down the Florida coast. And uh, I think the, the, the thing we should emphasize for people that are trying to wrap their head around what it is and why would it be of interest to people like Roger Wheeler or the, the winter Hill gang um, is because there, it was a, a sport that was, it was a vehicle for betting. Yeah. I mean, all sports are to an extent, sure. especially now in an era where betting is legalized. But if you can just picture a time in America where that wasn't the case and that uh, this was an entire sport that really, you know, their viewership and their uh, fan base was 90 percent based on the wagering that was going on. There was really no yeah, it wasn't like, a recreational sport like right. nationwide. Yeah. It was. Right, it was geared towards. There's a lot product. of betting, a lot of money going, yeah. uh, flowing in and out. The whole time Mike was describing that, all I'm thinking about is the Miami Vice intro, yeah. <laughs> and I can hear the music, I can hear the Jan Hammer music, and the and the women in the bathing suits. <laughs> I remember yeah. that. So t- talk a little bit about the fact that, so when, when he when he buys into World High Lie, he is encountered by a man named Paul Rico who was the head of security, who is a former big time FBI agent uh, in Boston and had been the guy that had recruited Whitey Bulger in the first place. And Rico retires from being <laughs> a dirty, <laughs> a dirty FBI agent and becomes the head of security at world high Lie as a point man for these uh, Southie gangsters. But Mike, what I want you to talk to is, at, I think people because because Wheeler was someone that was known as a as a tough guy and as a guy that liked to surround him. A lot of his businesses, he would hire retired FBI agents. Um, that they, I think, their idea was that he would hit it off with Rico or maybe be seduced by Rico. Uh, and in fact, him and Rico started to butt heads really quickly. Yes, he uh, really was attracted. To this business because of the retired FBI agents that were involved there. And uh, of course, Rachel was the point man for him. And, uh, you know, uh, it was in a time when you couldn't Google everything. I mean, you didn't have a, a computer in your hand. I mean, uh, research on uh, good and bad things was just a very time-consuming, if not impossible, situation. So uh, he just felt good about the FBI agents uh, being there. But uh, shortly thereafter, uh, he didn't think the uh, uh, the money was what it was uh, explained to him that it would be. And he kept questioning uh, Rico and uh, also the... the uh, um, executive manager of World Highlight, a guy named Dick Donovan. And uh, he wasn't getting very good answers uh, from him. So he was worried about that, and they weren't very forthcoming. And so this this started the bad relationship. Uh, He also got a letter at that time, uh, anonymous letter, Said I wouldn't buy this. If, you know, if I were you, there's things going on behind the scenes that uh, uh, you know you wouldn't approve of. So that's really interesting. Things, well, I think the irony is interesting. Really interesting. The way that uh, Mike just laid it out, there's an irony there that the people that were trying to dupe him thought the uh, that because he was comfortable with retired FBI agents working in his past companies that the draw to this, well, Hey, look, we have all these retired FBI agents that are keeping things nice yeah. and safe. On and, the up oh, and up. We have this, you know, Paul Rico, who was at the time, not known as a dirty FBI agent. He was known as a 
kind of a superstar FBI agent in in the uh, you know at least from a public perspective right. and the idea was to lure him in thinking hey this is all nice and buttoned up when in reality it was the exact opposite these were compromised uh, former federal law enforcement do we know who would have sent that letter just out of curiosity like who, yeah, were we able, were ever able we to trace tried, that we tried to trace that and we could never figure it out obviously it was someone on the inside um, but we don't know who that may have been. I mean, that's a real solid for someone to do to give him a heads up on that. If if he would have taken that seriously, he might be alive, <laughs> might be alive today. You know, but that was yeah. uh, interesting that someone tried to forewarn him. Like, so as we get into the away. as we get into the early eighties, he makes it clear that he's going to that. Well, first of all, he hires his own pr- private investigation firm and starts investigating the security force that he has on Warren Highway, right, Mike? Well, he was uh, trying to gather information on him. Uh, He decided that uh, maybe geographically, uh, if he got rid of uh, Hartford uh, in New England, maybe this would kind of cut the tie with any uh, potential Boston organized crime. So he put the the sale in progress uh, of uh, uh, Hartford, and uh, that sale actually um, finalized in March of 1981, and uh, you know that was uh, that was a reason for him to say that he was going to uh, uh, kind of call the staff some thinking that if he got enough staff that he would find uh, the uh, the link between organized crime and uh, the problem and uh, uh, his loss of revenue. So he started uh, making those noises. And in January of 1981, um, a, a Boston thug named Brian Halloran was approached by uh, by uh, Whitey Bulger and his partner, Steve Flemmy, and also a guy named John Callahan, who was the former president of World Highlight before Wheeler uh, made the purchase. And they said, hey, if this goes through, we're due to lose a million dollars a year. Uh, we want to... Uh, we were taken out, and we want it done in Tulsa because they'll never solve it there. <laughs> so Brian Halloran thought about it for a while, and he said, man, I want to go all the way to Tulsa. You know, I don't want to get caught up with the Boston accent in Tulsa, and, uh, you know, I feel good about this. So they gave him, you know, a few thousand bucks. And he declined it and went on down the road. Uh, so he didn't have any further involvement. But on May 27th of 81, uh, Roger Wheeler uh, was going to his, his uh, car after a round of golf. And uh, like I said, uh, it was Johnny Margarano that uh, opened the car door, shot him between the eyes, shut the door, and... Uh, walked to the getaway car where they drove out of Southern Hills and into rush hour traffic. And, uh, you know, that was it. So, you know, that was the start of a long odyssey of an investigation. Uh, You know, we tried to play by the rules. We tried to get along with the FBI. We uh, tried to share information. Turned out we shared too much. Uh, they played with us like a, you know, a cat played with a mouse, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I look back and I say, you know, if there was a, a Google, if there was, uh, if there were cell phones, um, if there, you know, we just had pagers at the time, and so it was really hard and difficult to try to uh, connect with people. 
uh, you know, all around the country. And, uh, uh, you know, that information seemed like everything was a dead end. And so uh, we were looking at some leads that we got in over the first couple of days, which really turned out to be a very interesting lead, lead off in a different direction of organized crime. And we met with the FBI agents in Tulsa and Oklahoma City, and they were going to handle the uh, the uh, organized crime angle on the East Coast. But was there was there a point when they were thinking maybe Dixie Mafia had something to do with this? And that was the lead that we got on. Um, we we got a a tip. We we put out a, a artist drawing, and uh, this artist, uh, an Indian artist that was in law enforcement at the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, was he just drew wonderful. Uh, suspect pictures. And uh, over the years, I saw him so many times uh, look like a picture. Uh, and it was a drawing. You know, you see the guy, the real bad guy, and you see what what uh, this uh, investigator drew, and you think, man, he just drew this off this picture. Um, so we got that, we put that out to the news media, and immediately, um, we got a call and said, hey, it looks like this guy named Pat Early. And uh, Pat Early was a guy in the Dixie Mafia, and um, he was a, he had the reputation to really, uh, you know, pull this off. He was a killer. He was a, a bomber. He, you know, he he had his finger in everything. And uh, he would know the people that he could uh, go to for uh, to be hidden out, you know, in, in the Oklahoma area. So we thought he was a very logical suspect. So we we focused on him along with uh, uh, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics in, um, in Oklahoma City. And... Um, you know, the story of Pat Early, he worked for a guy uh, that smuggled drugs just as a hobby. I mean, he would outfit uh, planes to, uh, to to smuggle those drugs. And, uh, you know, Pat Early was kind of his bodyguard, enforcer, whatever you want to call it. Pat Early would take on a buzzsaw. So we tried to uh, figure out how we were going to approach that. Uh, Pat, we we got an undercover guy into Pat, um, and uh, uh, he was trying to arrange a a large quantity of uh, uh, narcotics, and that never really materialized. Uh, Pat was uh, so. Uh, so leery of anything new to him. But one of the stories about Pat, this this uh, guy that that would smuggle drugs, he had a, a water well drilling company that was um, located in Libya. And he was of value to the CIA. And uh, so... <laughs> He and Pat were in Libya uh, on a, a some sort of company situation, and one of the people they were dealing with uh, told them, "Hey, I know these terrorist guys, and they stole a surface-to-air missile, and they're planning on using it." And so here's this guy from Oklahoma, the Dixie Mafia. And he's negotiating with terrorists to uh, gain control of this surface air missile. And that really did happen. So, you know, that was just a start of, you know, gee, this is a 
going to be an outlandish investigation. I mean, it's going to take me everywhere. And it really did. And that's not like we were talking about the, the fact that in 1981, you know, communication just in life is different. If I'm sure it's, uh, you know, a 180 from where it was uh, with law enforcement between the early 80s and now. But that's not accounting for the subterfuge that you were also encountering. So let's talk about when you finally get on to the fact that this could have come from organized crime in Boston and you start heading in that direction. But Jimmy wants to add. Yeah, I, I just want to before we do that, though, um, if you could just um, well, first of all, I'm not surprised that a drug dealer was connected to someone who's a CIA asset. Right. That does not surprise me at all. We've had episodes where we've touched up on that. But can you guys um, just unpack a little bit the Dixie Mafia? I think our audience might not yeah, so, know. I think that's an interesting case study. So the, but, the Dixie Mafia is, isn't is really what it sounds like. It's not like La Cosa Nostra where you have this very um, intertwined, interconnected group of 26 families that are operating around the country with a governing body in yeah, New York. Hierarchy. Right. The yeah. Dixie Mafia was like a loosely, very, very loosely, in some cases, not connected at all. But if there were connections, the connections were very loose. And it just, it just was a, a kind of a catch-all for any organized crime groups that were operating in southern uh, regions that had no La Cosa Nostra. So they were able to kind of operate unfettered. Um, but and, they were in the same stuff like prostitution, yeah. drugs, uh, and they were usually gambling, extortion, basically like hillbilly gangsters, yeah. cornbread mafia, <laughs> yeah, Alabama, hillbilly on. mafia, cornbread mafia, right. Dixie mafia, right? And there was like a you know, an a, a, this early guy was like, uh, you know, o and tell me if I'm if I'm right, uh, Mike, this early guy was like one of Oklahoma's you know, non Italian OC powers. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I'll tell you uh, something I haven't really shared with uh, many people, uh, but uh, uh, my uncle was a, uh, a bootlegger, and uh, he was a really powerful bootlegger and uh, corrupted, uh, I believe, up to the governor of the state of Oklahoma. And he corrupted a, uh, a district attorney. And, um, but I thought he, was, I, you know, as, as all this is going on, I'm just a kid growing up. And my dad didn't know about it, per se. My mom didn't really know about it. Uh, so I would, I would go over to their house. They had a really nice house. And um, I'd learn to ride a bicycle. And uh, the Dixie Mafia was hanging out at my aunt and uncle's house. So I met some of these guys. I don't know if I met early, uh, but I met some uh, Dixie Mafia guys. And, uh, you know, I was just a kid. Uh, but, uh, you know, they were uh, part of the crew. Uh, they flew from Tulsa. Uh, to McNary County, Tennessee, uh, and they killed uh, Buford Pusser's wife. They shot Buford Pusser up, and uh, uh, they they flew back. And uh, over the years, uh, when that happened, I don't know. Uh, this was before I came on the police department when that happened. But my partner in homicide, uh, Dick Bishop. Uh, he ran into Buford Pusser because Buford Pusser had a, a trust, if you will, uh, so he could investigate his wife's murder. And it brought him to Tulsa very frequently. And so uh, that's that's what happened to him. Um, let's let's just Buford let, Pusser was yeah. Uh, so walking sheriff, walking know, tall. Him. Let's let's just drop a couple pop culture. Uh, you know, tidbits that, that have sprinkled on our conversation. So uh, Buford Pusser, who we just referenced, was the kind of the, was a sheriff that was the basis of the movie Walking Tall. Uh, first, Joe Don Baker played him in the 70s. And then one of my favorite movies that The Rock has ever been in was a remake of, of Walking Tall. I think it was one of The Rock's first movies. Um, 
So that's kind of, uh, you know, art imitating life, uh, you know, in terms of Dixie Mafia stuff. But we also, about five, ten minutes ago, talked about Brian Halloran and how the Roger Wheeler murder was um, coordinated. So if you remember the movie, for people that are listening, if they've seen or remember the movie Black Mass with Johnny Depp playing Whitey Bulger, there is both a scene depicting... Roger Wheeler's uh, murder at Southern Hills. But there's also a character played by actor uh, Peter Sarsgaard who plays Brian Halloran. And and then I want to tie this back into when you uh, realize that the Dixie Mafia angle is not the right angle to be going after and you kind of turn your attention to, to South Boston or what's going on in, in Massachusetts. But Halloran being recruited to possibly be the hitter in this. And the fact that Whitey Bulger is cooperating with the FBI secretly and is being fed information. The information was going both ways. So Brian Halloran, by being asked to commit the Wheeler murder, even though he uh, turned it down, he is exposed when all this Wheeler stuff starts to pop up. And as Mike knows, and then I want to turn it over to Mike, you know, Halloran got killed uh, because the FBI was protecting Whitey Bulger. They told Whitey, hey, just so you know, Brian Halloran's been in our office and he told us that you killed Roger Wheeler and he told us that, uh, you know, you did all this other stuff. So, you know, and that was some of that was portrayed in the movie black mass. So uh, Mike, take us back to when you kind of get hip to uh, the, the winter Hill guys as possibly being culprits here. Well, in uh, I believe it was July of 1981. Uh, we were summoned, if you will, to um, Massachusetts. And we met with the, uh, the uh, director of the state police, uh, Colonel O'Donovan, who was a legend. And uh, it was a very cryptic uh, meeting. He said uh, that there might be some Boston guys involved, and uh, he gave us some names. Uh, I don't know if Whitey Bulger's name was in it initially, uh, but he opened the door. And we uh, developed this association with the uh, state police. And uh, it turns out that uh, Brian Halloran had a brother that was a state trooper. And so some of this information is coming from Brian to his brother to the head of state police. I don't think I knew that. Wow. uh, Yeah. it, It got very confusing of who you could talk to and who you couldn't talk to and uh, who knew about it and who was kept secret from it. So it was uh, it was really uh, uh, frustrating, sometimes scary. Um, and, uh, you know, for a guy from Oklahoma uh, uh, kind of stepping into this world of organized crime, um, you know, I have always had an interest in it, but, you know, I, I never thought I would uh, experience it so up close and personal and uh, have so much on the line, uh, whether it be uh, safety-wise, uh, whether it be reputation-wise, because uh, these guys uh, played for keeps every which way. I mean, they were, they didn't like you. They trashed your reputation. Uh, you know, they set you up. I mean, there were things that went on in this case that uh, I look back today and I say, God, I can't believe that I made it through this case. And, uh, you know, I, I really only um, only did. I mean, I was really thinking about trying to uh, promote and get away from this case. I mean, I. Chief of police had kind of promised me that 
that I'd have a, a a good chance to make some good promotions. And I said, all, all I ever wanted to do was be a homicide detective. And so I didn't take those up, but um, sometimes I kind of wish I did when I look at my pension. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it just really was uh, an eye opener for me. So when you went to look, hung up on that, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Fine. Mike, I wanted to ask you about something that I think you encountered in Boston and, and I want you to speak to it or, or correct me if I'm speaking uh, out of school, but w- wasn't there a, a situation where it was either this trip to Boston or another trip to Boston where they brought Bulger and Flemmy into the FBI office or the state police office and there was like a two minute conversation <laughs> like, hey, guys, we want to know if you had anything to do with the Roger Wheeler murder. And they were both like, nope, sorry, nothing to see here. And they were like, all right, sorry, you guys can go home. And then they came back to you guys. were like, eh, we asked them and they said no. So you, you, there's nothing to see here. Well, that's exactly true, although we weren't there when that uh, happened. OK. Uh, or we would have, uh, you know, caught the guys on the way out of the building or something. They sat uh, Fleming and Bulger. Uh, down in a room together and and said, hey, did you guys do this? And they said no, and that was it. I mean, truly, that was it. And, um, you know, that's just not the way you do things. And, you know, I I don't know why they um, thought they could keep that secret from us, but they tried to uh, for a while. I mean, not all FBI agents, involved were were bad uh but some of them stunk and uh uh you know other guys that didn't agree with them would kind of give me a phone call here or there and say uh you know hey watch out this guy's on their side wow and stuff like that wow well, he's talking about promotions and it's like well what's the motive in addition to john conley who was the the main corrupted FBI agent who grew up with or grew up in the same neighborhood as Bulger and eventually became his mole in the government. But, you know, he was, Bulger was giving him some things, but besides that, talking about promotions, Conley and his unit or whatever used Bulger and Flemmy to make cases against the Italian Mafia in Boston, Jerry Angelo, yeah. uh, the Raymond Patriarca, that Larry Zanino, that whole crew, and and wiped those wiped all those guys out by the by the mid eighties, and Conley was looked at as a as a hero, yeah, gangbuster, and got pro- and got promotions based on Bulger and Flemmy helping them bring down the Italians, but in return. Bulger and Fleming got all that territory that the Italians left when they went to prison. Yeah, that was the whole point. Right. Yeah. So, and Mike, did you have any direct dealings with Conley? Did you ever talk to him about this investigation? Oh yeah, I did. Um, Conley also uh, bragged. I mean, just outright bragged that uh, in order to bring down the uh, Italians, uh, that he in the quote, his Irish would be okay. So uh, that's that's where that went. And, uh, you know, from a guy that has uh, Irish roots and, um, you know, my family came in from, from Dublin uh, to uh, Boston, uh, you know, I really felt something unique here. Uh, just uh, history and, and whatever. And, and to see it just perverted into, you know, this guy's getting away with murder or this guy rigged the lottery or, um, you know, things like that. And I'm thinking, how in the hell could I be caught up in this thing? And do I want to get off this uh, merry-go-round or not? It actually was my, my last conversation with my, with my dad. In the early 80s, um, you know, I, I talked to him about, hey, I, I think I'm smack dab in the middle of, of uh, some FBI corruption and wow. a lot of things going on. And, uh, uh, you know, I just didn't 
I didn't think I could win uh, this deal. I mean, I really, I looked at it. I said, you know, here I am, you know, this very young detective, very inexperienced. I mean, I had plenty of murders under my belt, but, you know, uh, a, a, a gang murder in, uh, in Tulsa is a little bit different than a gang land murder, you know. And uh, so my dad just said, hey, uh, stick with this and, and see it through. And I don't think he had any idea of what he was telling me. Uh, but uh, that's all I could hear uh, from from the time his death on. I mean, this you know, he told me this the night before his death. And so he's the one that kind of pointed me in the right, right direction to keep on with the steel. So what, what point does the case go from, I mean, was it always an open active case or it, was there a point where they kind of put it to bed, but you were still tasked with being, if there was, you know, any breaking news, that's going to go to Mike or any breaking uh, tips. that's going to go to Mike. Was there ever a point when the, 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 the case was actually put like on the back burner or was it always on the front burner? Well, uh, for me, it was always on the front burner. I don't think the police department really uh, was keeping track of all I was doing. Um, I pretty much uh, kept it to myself. I made reports if anybody asked, but, you know, your eyes could glaze over looking at all my reports. And uh, so, you know, it stayed on the front burner. Um, Pat Early uh, was there for about a year. We spent a lot of time in Oklahoma City, and uh, he finally got popped on a small drug charge. And so I was there uh, the next morning, or maybe later that night. And, uh, you know, Pat Early, um, he didn't uh, have any good thoughts at all about the police. He. <laughs> had uh, had already made up his mind he wasn't going to talk. And uh, so I just sat down and started talking to him. And uh, you know, I mentioned who my uncle was, and he recalled him. And, uh, um, I mean, that alone didn't, didn't make him talk, but uh, it got him thinking about me and, and whatever. I asked him if he ever remembered a kid over at uh, uh, my uncle's house when they were hanging out there on occasion. And, uh, uh, you know, he didn't say for sure he did, but um, he didn't tell me to get out of the room. He didn't lawyer up. And so I sat and talked to him. And, uh, um, you know, the one interesting thing, I mean, sure, he's going to, He's going to deny that uh, he had anything to do with it. And I, I, by this time, I didn't think he did. Uh, but uh, he said uh, something interesting. He said, uh, uh, all I heard was that the First Bank of Boston was behind this. Wow. And so it didn't really soak in at that time. You know, the, the information is just coming in like crazy. So, you know, you got so many pieces of minutia, and you couldn't quite figure out where they fit in the puzzle. It's that interesting that— piece. Oh, sorry. To, I was just going to say it's interesting that the Dixie Mafia was already hearing gossip in the underworld that they would that that would already make its way to them, even though they had nothing to do with it. No, no skin in the game. That that's really intriguing, especially that deep. Yeah. Not just like all oh, these Irish guys, and but like the bank. So, so are you keeping tabs on what's going on in Boston through the '80s into the '90s when Boulder eventually? Uh, gets indicted and goes on the run. So what's going on between? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, between um, let's say the, and, the after the case is super hot, uh, and then as the as the decade goes on, what's what's your uh, position? Well, this is a long story. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, uh, in May of 1982, uh, 
Brian Halloran gets gunned down in Boston. Uh, him and a kid named Michael Donahue. Uh, Donahue's dad was a uh, sergeant on the Boston Police Department, and he <laughs> had just uh, he had just decided to give Brian Halloran a ride home from uh, this bar. Yeah, wrong place, oh, wrong that, time. That, yeah, that I didn't know. Yeah, wrong place, wrong time. Yeah. yeah. Right on the water in South Boston. Yeah, that I knew, yeah. Yes. And uh, so, uh, you know, the car drove up, gunned him down, um, all this stuff. And so it was uh, probably three or four days after that before we even got word of that murder. Because, again, that communication just, uh, you know, hadn't, hadn't caught up. And so uh, we decided uh, at that time to uh, uh, go to Boston. We went to Boston. Nobody wanted to help us except the state police. And, and these guys, the Connecticut State Police, uh, who had investigated uh, Wheeler's purchase of the Hartford phone phone, and those guys were great. They were just so smart and uh you know they taught me so much um so uh we kind of formed an alliance and uh, uh you know we got with the city of boston and uh pd and we're working with them and so we all had a uh, kind of a confab and uh that's where the first really real revelation that the FBI is involved in this thing. And uh, these guys had the history on Paul Rico. Uh, they had the history of how Paul Rico connected to uh, Winter Hill. And, uh, you know, this was uh, something that uh, upset us so much because the FBI and uh, the, the Department of Justice had Halloran, and he was talking about our murder, and they didn't call us. And so, wow, uh, then Halloran gets killed. And uh, um, so we went up there, and we, we made a, a few enemies by uh, letting them know that, you know, this is our case, not theirs, uh, you know, Somebody gets prosecuted for murder. It's in Tulsa, not in Boston. And um, so that was the case. So as as that died down, we started trying to make a plan. Uh, we made a plan to uh, try to bring John Callahan in and turn him into a uh, a source of information. Uh, because uh, Halloran was a little bit further out on the scope than Callahan. Callahan was right at kind of the middle of it. And uh, so we thought he's the next guy. So um, myself and a Massachusetts State Trooper and a couple guys from Connecticut State Police and, and my partner, uh, we went to... Uh, a prosecutor, he was the head of the Organized Crime Strike Force in New England. His name was Jeremiah O'Sullivan. And um, I just, I was surprised that uh, we were unannounced. He led us into his office and uh, we started uh, uh, talking to him and confronted him about uh, Brian Howard. He said it was his decision uh, to cut Brian Howard loose without talking to us. And, uh, you know, we kind of had some words over that. Um, he, uh, we also told him that uh, we needed his help. And I mean, you know, when you go into a, a federal prosecutor, you think you're really talking to somebody that, is doing the right thing. And uh, we told him we needed help to uh, to bring John Callahan in and give him a deal. 
if he was involved in this murder conspiracy. And so he didn't give us any indication that he would, but he didn't tell us outright no. So we went looking for Callahan. And, uh, uh, you know, this guy was out on town every day and night in Boston. So we had to travel to a bunch of different bars <laughs> to try to find him. And uh, we didn't find him. And uh, so there was an article in a newspaper up there. And the town leaked like a sieve. I mean, it was crazy. Everybody was talking in Beantown. Yes. <laughs> and somebody um, uh, leaked, I think it was the Globe, uh, that detectives in Tulsa were trying to serve Callahan with a grand jury subpoena, which was not true. We just wanted to talk to him. And um, so we looked and looked and looked, spent three or four more days there, um, couldn't find him, came back to Tulsa, and uh, it was literally, um, I mean, I almost stepped in the door of my front front door of my house, and the phone was ringing, and I picked it up, and uh, somebody asked, hey, is this Detective Mike Huff? I said, yeah, and uh, he said, hey, uh, this is uh, Detective Hammerschmidt, I'll never forget his name, uh, from uh, Metro-Dade Police Department in Florida. So you're looking for John Callahan? And I said, yeah, been looking all week for him. And he said, well, we got him uh, down here. And I thought, oh, great, we're going to change clothes, repack the bags, and head back to, to Miami. And he said, he's in the trunk of a car at the airport, and there was a dime on his chest. Wow. Uh, and uh, all this is, is crashing in on me. And this, this, mm-hmm. just to get the audience understand or the the listeners understand this. So Hallahan is murdered in May. Callahan is murdered in I think the first week of August, last week of July. Yeah. So this is all happening in the same two months. Yeah, which right. was a year after Wheeler yeah. was killed. Yes, nineteen eighty-two. Uh, so between uh, uh, Halloran's murder and. Uh, the first of August, we had made a couple trips to Boston, and um, you know we really just—I don't want to say we had given up in uh, in August, but I was scared that the city of Tulsa was going to give up for us because there's a lot of money floating around uh, on these trips and stuff. You know, I mean. It just wasn't in the budget to um, to chase a mob hit all over the country. Uh, it was kind of expensive, uh, but uh, I think everybody got their eyes opened up when they heard heard the story uh, about uh, O'Sullivan, uh, his uh, comments that he didn't let Howard talk to us, and uh, Howard winds up dead, and then. We tell him that we want to talk to Callahan, and then Callahan winds up dead. And, uh, you know, this is just, uh, we just didn't really know what, we knew we were in the middle of a hurricane. Uh, but It's a crossfire hurricane. You were getting it from yes. all sides because the yes. FBI in Boston was feeding Winter Hill and Whitey Bulger information directly from intelligence files and <laughs> who was informing on what now yes. what, was there pressure from did wheeler have family i mean are, are you is there like local pressure to solve this case i mean what what's the what's the atmosphere like in tulsa during all of this well uh, telex is one of the biggest employers in tulsa and it really supported thousands more jobs than just the company itself. I mean, a lot of uh, 
you know, contractors, things like that. Um, so everybody was concerned about this. They expected this to be solved. Uh, the family, uh, not so much, other than uh, one of his sons, David Wheeler, uh, who had uh, been sent to Miami to run a computer program to try to figure out where the money was going. And so David had a, a real bird's eye view of what's going on there. And he absolutely um, didn't care for Paul Rico. He thought Paul Rico was behind this. Uh, Paul Rico is the person that actually informed him of his dad's death. Um, he flew back to Tulsa. Um, and at this time, you know, this was when we were so tied up on the Dixie Mafia. And the FBI had suggested, and our brass agreed, that they would handle the uh, East Coast organized crime angle on World Highlight. Um, so in that, uh, the FBI agent said, he would use uh, David Wheeler as his source to get him information at uh, at High Life. And uh, well, he's lucky he know, didn't get that, killed at that point. Yeah, oh, David yeah. Wheeler's lucky. That's what I mean. He didn't end up dead. That's what I mean. Yes, absolutely. And, so, and Mike, we agreed to that. Finish up, Mike. Mike sorry. Oh, we agreed to that. But we had no idea what we were agreeing to. I mean, we expected everybody's honest. Everybody's, you know, is going to try to solve this case, and it wasn't that. So let's draw the line now as we as we come to a close here. I, I could I could have this conversation yeah, for another two hours. I love it with yeah. Mike, and we're going to bring you back on at some point, Mike. Uh, for for a. Uh, I want to do a for Dixie Mafia encore, episode for, now. I really do for an encore <laughs> uh, uh, appearance because you're you've just been great. This is the exact type of perspective and insight we want to give our listeners and viewers. You know, going straight to the source. And Mike, like we said, he was there at Ground Zero, and then he saw it through to the very end, thirty years later. And that's where I want to bring us to. Uh, so the 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 links that you can make between Wheeler May of eighty one. Uh, Halloran, May of 82, Callahan, August of 82, all gangland style murders tied to World High Lie, ordered by Whitey Bulger at the top of the Winter Hill Gang, but carried out all three of these murders carried out by John Martirano. Now, Whitey was with him on the Halloran hit, but Martirano. Uh, single-handedly killed Wheeler with Bulger killed Halloran and then down in Florida killed Callahan who I from from my research again tells me that Callahan and Martirano were like best friends yeah. and uh, uh, and, and uh, Martirano did not kill Halloran uh, that was why and another guy okay I stand, uh, so Martirano was not at that hit no okay I stand corrected but so, but he, but he definitely killed Callahan. Yes. And then 1995, Bulger's reign comes to an end. A couple years before that, uh, John Conley, who had been his uh, primary mole in the FBI, had retired. Bulger's indicted in 95, along with Flemmy, along with Johnny Martirano. Um, Bulger goes on the run and is missing for the next 16 years. But Flemmy and, and Martirano uh, go into custody a lot quicker, and they both end up cooperating. And does, does Martirano's cooperation solve this case for you? Well, it, it helped. But there are so many pieces, uh, pieces of the puzzle that, uh, you know, it was more than just uh, saying, hey, I did it. Uh, it's over. Um, you know, in um, in the eighties, um, we had kind of thought we we're uh, at a not a dead end, but nothing much was happening. 
uh, in the late eighties, and uh, I got approached by a reality uh, TV show. And at that time, they didn't exist. Uh, the very first one was called Unsolved Mysteries, and um, so we got permission to do that, and uh, they reenacted it. And um, I also put up uh, a couple uh, pictures of persons of interest. Uh, one of them was uh, Martirano. And uh, so that very first show had a viewership of extraordinary uh, numbers. And that was the first um, Unsolved Mysteries ever. That was the pilot yeah, mm-hmm. for Unsolved Mysteries oh, in wow. 1987. Robert Stack, yeah. right? <laughs> Wasn't he the, the host? The first thing? episode That's of Unsolved cool. Mysteries, uh, Mike is referring to, and, was the they, they, case? and they, they featured uh, the Wheeler case. That's cool. Yeah, actually, it was Raymond Burr. Oh, it was Raymond Burr. Oh. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Pre-Bob Stack. He's, he's, he remembers everything. Pre-Bob Mike, Stack. Mike, Mike remembers everything. <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, Iron this side. comes to me years later after... Uh, Margarano is uh, in Testy, and I, I meet up with him. And um, he said he was on vacation in Hawaii. Here's a hitman on vacation in Hawaii. And he's, he's sitting on a bed, putting on his shoes, and uh, Unsolved Mysteries is showing. And he said, I looked up, and I, I saw my picture. Uh, on TV, and you saying that you wanted to talk to me. And uh, he said, I knew right then that I was going to meet you. And uh, he said, it spoiled my vacation. So I got to check a lot of that. <laughs> and so as uh, things are, are coming to a head with uh, Bulger and Flemmy and all this stuff, and, and they're, um, the state police of Massachusetts are, are putting that together, uh, they have somebody uh, that they're kind of talking to that says, hey, I don't know what this guy's name is. I can't remember what his name is, uh, but it was on a rerun of Unsolved Mysteries. And uh, some cop out somewhere uh, said he wanted to talk to him. And I know he's hooked in with these guys, but I, can't, I don't know what his name is. And so they researched Unsolved Mysteries, and they figured out, oh, they're talking about Margarano. So through this guy, they were able to arrest Margarano. So our decision to to do Unsolved Mysteries brought Margarano into the fold. And uh, so I felt real good about that. And, and wasn't it the case that once – people started to realize like it as the nineties start to come to a close and now we're, you know, five years removed from Whitey being off the streets. You're going on 30 years removed from the Wheeler case, but you had a number of organized crime figures from new England sitting behind bars. We, and I'm glad you pointed out that uh, Martirano was only caught because of unsolved mysteries in a in a segment about Roger Wheeler, which eventually brings Martirano into custody based on a tip, but um, and he starts singing right away. Right, right but right. what I'm saying is there are a number of guys that were linked up with Whitey in one way or the other, or linked up with Winter Hill one way or the other, both Irish and Italian, because this included uh, Martirano and included Cadillac Frank Salemi, who was the 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 Boston Italian mafia boss in the '90s, who was a uh, aligned connected with, with, to the with, Irish, with, yeah. with Southie and, and Winter Hill. But you had a number of guys that while they're in prison going over their case documents, come to the conclusion that this whole time I've been in bed with a confidential informant, AKA whitey. And all of these guys, uh, I'm pretty sure line up at the prosecutor's door to cut deals <laughs> because they feel so, uh, yeah. you know, uh, so wronged, by Whitey and it and it really had nothing to do with, um, break. They, and none of these guys see that they broke an oath. They're like an oath was broken against me. <laughs> like, right. 
Right. <laughs> yes, that's true. And uh, it didn't happen uh, very quick. It took over a year or so to uh, to negotiate with Martirano because he had so many bodies attached to him, so many different jurisdictions. Everybody had to sign off on this deal, think, yeah. and everybody's family had to sign off on it. If Martirano just kept his mouth shut, he would have been a free man in a couple of years. So Martirano, yeah. was, he was killing guys for the Italians too, right? Wasn't he on both both sides because his, his brother, brother was his a, brother became a capo for right. uh, for Salemi. Okay. Yeah. Uh he was he dated all the way back to the 60s and the, the Irish mob wars, but I do think he was taking some contracts from Angelo in the 70s. Yeah. Uh I, I think the another point I want to make is so the the FBI made this conscious decision basically to trade the Italians for the Irish. But if you look at the the um, the records or you look at the stats and you're talking about homicides that you can tie to each organization. It's the, there were not, I mean, there were murders in the Italian mafia. I'm not saying there weren't, but let's say you go from 1970 to uh, 1995. Whitey Bulger was responsible for probably triple the amount of murders uh, than the Italians were. He was a lot more bloodthirsty. Yeah. Yeah, he is evil. And uh, so, did you get to meet with you? Got to meet with Johnny Martirano? Oh yeah, uh, several times. Um, you know, I even uh, I was in Boston after he uh, uh, was uh, released from jail, and uh, we sat uh, at a bar together and, and had drinks and <laughs> talked about it. Wow! And uh, you know, he's not. He, no way, not a friend uh, at all. I, I don't have any respect for him other than the fact that he did what he said he was going to do, and that was uh, solve the Wheeler murder and uh, talk about Whitey and whatever. So, what a uh, journey! What an know. odyssey that you that you uh, and, and what 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 I think. How does it speak to? Or look, look how it speaks to the constitution of, of of a guy like Mike Huff and the people that were uh, a part of his team in Tulsa and the resilience and the, you know, the, the you want to talk about keeping an oath. I mean, this is the definition of keeping an oath, the oath that he made as a as a police officer to to protect and serve. Uh, this is, you know, this was the ultimate you know, 30 years fighting an uphill battle that even without the fact that people that should have been on your team were actually pretending to be on your team when in fact we're on the other team. If you just take that away, it's an uphill battle, but you add that, you know, into uh, the situation and it's, you know, you've, you've climbed Mount Olympus, uh, you know, you, you have uh, reached the pinnacle and, and we just, we tip, we tip our hat to you. And this has been an, an amazing conversation. Well, thank you so much for having me. But I got to tell you, this is about one third of the story. I, I know, I, I know, and I'm, I'm 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 angry that we couldn't spend another couple hours talking about this. Well, give me a call back. But, yeah, but, thank you, Mike. But Mike, before we uh, uh, sign off, just take us like through the maybe the last decade. You when did you retire from? Just a, a real quick. Just when, when did you retire from the force? I retired uh, 2011, uh, 30 years to the day after Wheeler uh, got killed. Uh, so, you know, back in um, the mid 90s, I think it was. Uh, hell, I can't remember the exact date. Uh, but we got um, Margarino and we got Flemmy on board. And the two of them, uh, gave us the puzzle pieces to get to Paul Rico, who was the middleman. Paul Rico worked for Wheeler. Uh, he was the connection to uh, uh, Bulger, who he called Jack from South Boston uh, on all his notes, back and forth we found on his desk. And uh, we uh, 
we finally got the DA to uh, file charges. And Rico, uh, it was kind of, Rico was indicted and he, he died under indictment, right? In 04. He, he did. Um, he, we arrested him and uh, treated him with respect and uh, took him to jail. And uh, uh, the jail at uh, Dade County is like a third world country. And uh, <laughs> we, we brought him in there. He looked like he was uh, uh, dressed to kill. <laughs> and here was a guy that had a, a goiter hanging from his neck, oh, with pus dripping out of it. And, uh, and Rico looks at me and he goes, you're not going to leave me here, are you? And I said, well, I'm sure not taking you home with me. And That's so, great. Uh, you know, that was uh, uh, the next to the last time I saw him. He had some sort of altercation in the Dade County Jail. And uh, we didn't know if he was faking it or what. Um, but we finally got uh, the approval for an air ambulance to transport him uh, from uh, Miami to Tulsa, you know, of course, with a, a, a deputy uh, to extradite him. And uh, so I met him at the airport and, uh, you know, we talked about it. And uh, he got so upset at me, he crapped in his pants. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, he, you know, the, the shit was literally hitting the fan at that point. So, <laughs> yes. uh, Mike, uh, so, so are you, are, are, the last thing I want to ask you is, are, are you on a cold case squad right now in retirement? Oh, yeah. So you're still, uh, yeah, I mean, even though you're retired, you're still dabbling in, in law enforcement. Well, I... I uh, the sheriff who used to work for me in homicide, as soon as he got elected, he said, hey, could you look at some cold cases for me? He had about 35. Uh, so I uh, went out and started recruiting people. I got uh, friends of mine that were in the FBI, ATF, DEA, at TPD, and we all volunteer our time. And, uh, you know, it's something to do, keep us out of the bars. <laughs> well, we owe, the society owes you a debt, my friend. We owe you a debt here at the OG uh, podcast, Mike. Thank you so much. This has been this has exceeded expectations, and I had pretty high expectations for this interview. So, Mike, you you hit it out of the ballpark. Well, call me back. Thank yes, you, sir. Thank you, Mike. So this is uh, well. We'll see you next week. We'll, we'll have more, uh, you know, hard hitting content like we bring you every week with guests like Mike Mike Huff. Uh, last week we had uh, retired ATF Ignacio Esteban, and we're going to keep on bringing you the, the the best guests that are possible on both sides of the law. Keep breaking down all the the most pressing gangland news uh, available, and keep giving you all the great content that you expect from the OG podcast. I'm Scott Bernstein. For Jimmy Bucciolato and our producer, Ben, we are out. <laughs>